Well, ever since I was a kid, I have hated waste, waste of any kind, uh, but specifically seeing good things wasted. So, you know, a, a humorous thing would be the cookie dough in the, the bowl. And I, don't, I just do not understand people, and my wife will laugh, when you leave cookie dough in the mixing bowl and throw it out. You don't like scrape it out. Like you would, why, you can make a whole other cookie out of what's left over. I just don't get it. And so my wife will leave these bowls in the sink and then she'll put water on it. I'm like, if you're going to leave it, just leave it without water on it and somebody else can come and like finish it off, right? Or perhaps you have kids and you've served them steak before and horror of horrors, they leave steak on the plate at the end of the meal. I, I personally don't throw that in the garbage. That's like that. We paid for that. We're eating that. You don't have to eat it. I'll eat it. Leftovers. That's fine. Whatever we value, if it's more valuable to us, we hate to waste it. I know many of us would not enjoy at all working a full day of work on a project only to reach the end of the day and realize everything you had done needed to be undone and redone and was wasted. How annoying is a day of wasted labor over nothing? So annoying. And that's why I know this morning, as we think about waste and wasting, none of us wants to waste our suffering. The truth is that each one of us hates to waste what is valuable to us. And that's why I'm certain no one is interested in wasting their suffering because suffering represents what's valuable. Our comfort, our family, our finances, our relationships. Nobody wants to throw those away needlessly. You don't want to waste your suffering. If you are going to suffer the loss of any of these things, it had better be worth it. It had better be valuable. And this morning, God's word in 1 Peter is going to show us how to avoid wasting our suffering by showing us the ultimate purpose of our suffering. And this isn't rocket science. The purpose of our suffering is to bring glory to God. Probably everyone here is like, yeah, I knew that. But here's the deal. Not all suffering brings glory to God. There's a type of suffering that does, but there's a type of suffering that does not. It's just not enough for us to hear, yep, suffering brings glory to God, and then plow into whatever suffering comes our way and just be like, I'm just going to make it through to the other side. That's not all there is to it. It's how we endure through it that is honoring to God. It makes a difference. So today we're going to see three ways that we can suffer in such a way that God receives glory so that our suffering is not wasted. So here's the first one. We embrace the right attitude towards suffering. If you want to make sure your suffering is not wasted, embrace the right attitude. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Just so you have context, the people that the apostle Peter is addressing in this letter live in what is now known as modern day Turkey. And he's writing to elect exiles, he calls them. These are people God has chosen. He has saved particularly mostly Gentiles that he has saved because of early missionaries that went out after they heard the message of Jesus and they evangelized in this area. Now they're saved. There's some churches started. Peter's writing to these churches and these churches are filled with people that have converted away from pagan gods. And by converting, they are now different. Their lives have been upended. Their lifestyles are very different than what they were before. And this shows itself in so many different ways. Commentators will note some of their, their peers and colleagues would have called them unpatriotic because these believers had refused to worship the emperor as God any longer or even to give any sign of worship to the emperor because they worshiped only the true God. They were, they were viewed not only that way, but as disloyal because they didn't, like to be part of civic ceremonies that included idol worship. They were seen as unprofessional in their trade because a lot of the guilds that they were part of met in pagan temples and also had pagan rituals associated with them. So sometimes at work, they stepped out and they just weren't part of the crowd. You might think of the scene where a whole bunch of the crew after work goes to a, a place that no Christian should ever darken the door of. They weren't part of that. And so they were seen as different. They were seen as haters of families because their families were still into this cult worship, into this pagan worship, and they weren't. Not only that, but their lifestyle themselves, their morals had changed. 
They weren't into the drunken sexual orgies that their, their families were part of. And their families were actually surprised when they didn't take part in it anymore. And because of it, scripture says they maligned them. They made fun of them. They poked at them. They were suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. They were different. People didn't like that and it cost them. So these are the people Peter is writing to when he says these things. They were insulted, abused, pushed away from families, perhaps lost their jobs, experienced financial hardships. And in coming years, they would also be imprisoned and executed for their faith. So Peter's writing this letter, not because it's a pretty scene, but because he wants to address the reality they face and to give them biblical perspective on their suffering. So this is what he says in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We don't have to go further than one word to pull out something very, very important. The very first word Peter addresses them, he says, beloved. You can like highlight that. You can underline that in your Bible and come back to this passage over and over again when you encounter suffering. Peter knows the very first thing that happens in the life of believers when they endure suffering is a temptation enters their mind to think, God doesn't love me. To think, this is happening because I made a mistake. God doesn't love me. He knows, Peter knows, don't be surprised, beloved, remember this. And maybe you've believed that at well. Maybe it's one thing to be told on Sunday morning, hey, expect trials, expect suffering. But then when you actually start losing family over faith in Jesus, when you start actually losing finances, positions, you might start to doubt God's love for you. And that would be one of Satan's prime attacks as a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. If he can attack the notion that God loves you and make you doubt that, then he's attacked the very core of our faith because it all comes back to the cross and what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. If he can make you doubt God's love, then he can make you doubt what happened on the cross. He can make you doubt because there is absolutely nothing more that God could do or needs to do in order to prove his love for you because it's proven on the cross. When Jesus Christ died for you, God the Father sent his son for you. There, there literally is nothing God could do more to show his love for you, nothing. Nothing. So if you don't believe God's love, that means you don't believe the cross of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished there. The cross proves his love. If you are in Christ, no matter, no matter the level of suffering that you engage in or suffer because of following Jesus, he absolutely loves you. 110%, and we'll see exactly how. This next section of the verse really hit home for me this week though. It says, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised. Your mind should not be Whoa, I didn't expect that. When it comes to the fiery trial, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. If you're like me, this last year has included a lot of head shaking. Like what in the world is going on? This is insane. Our world is nuts. It absolutely is. And today, still today in Alberta, we have a pastor sitting in jail, not because he was sexually perverted, not because he stole finances, but because he gathered outdoors with believers to worship. This is insane. We have people, even in this church, that have been demoted, that have experienced financial hardship, that have experienced family tension over their stand for biblical values. And it can be like, this is crazy. We have had friends that we thought were friends call us out for standing up for a biblical view of marriage. This is crazy, except scripture is saying, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. This is actually the norm for Christian life. 
This is the normal Christian life. So many of us, myself included, have said things like, I wish we could return to normal. I get what you mean by that, but what if the last, I don't know, five, 10 years of your life have in some ways been abnormal in that you actually haven't suffered anything for the name of Jesus Christ? Historically speaking, that's kind of abnormal. And perhaps it's because like me, at times you've been silent about your faith. You've been silent about speaking truth into the world because you're kind of like Satan's tactics have worked. He's shown other people standing up and speaking truth and you've seen them kind of slaughtered. You've seen them kind of attacked. You've seen the cost and you're like, I'll try to do it a different way. I'll try to go through the Christian life without suffering because then I'm successful. But that's not true. That's not our, our aim as Christians is not to avoid any and all suffering. Our aim is to be faithful to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to live the normal Christian life. Trials and suffering are part of it. When Jesus said, come follow me, he also said words like this, Luke 6, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man. Ouch. Like that's supposed to be normal. Blessed are you even. This past March, so not this March, but what well, was it this March? I think it was this March. It was this March and the March before. Our church participated in the 40 days for life, standing outside of Met Hospital and holding these pray to end abortion signs. And this March, just a few months ago, a brother and I went out and we held these signs we smiled and we prayed. And I counted between 15 and 20 people in the hour we were there that shot me the middle finger and leaned out of their window and swore at us. And this year, it didn't surprise me because I'd been there last year. And last year, it did actually surprise me because I'm like, the sign says pray to end abortion. It doesn't say God hates you. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says pray to end abortion. And I was smiling but people hate us when we speak the truth. Even if you speak the truth kindly and calmly, peacefully, they hate the truth. They hate the one truth represents. You represent that person, they will hate you. I have not been given the finger 15 to 20 times in an hour, any time in my life, as before, maybe, maybe there's times, maybe, maybe when I was driving, sometimes there's pe times people have given me the finger and maybe I deserved it some of those times. But seriously, that should not surprise you. And it's actually really good to engage in some of these things where we stand for truth publicly because it builds your resolve. You're like, oh, it doesn't actually feel that bad to get the finger 15 times when you're standing for truth. It's kind of, I'm immune to it now. Somebody shoots me the finger, oh well, whatever. It's not a big deal. Peter doesn't want the believers to be surprised by the fiery trials because this. Surprised people tend to be skittish. They tend to back away. They tend to think, oh, I'm doing something wrong. Peter's like, I know most times in life when suffering comes, you think I'm doing something wrong, but know this, if you're doing what's right, what God has called you to, this is just normal, expect it. So how do we make this a tangible reality for each of us here? We always thought, I always thought, some of this stuff could happen over there. I know it. I've read biographies. I've read about Brother Andrew suffering. I've read about Richard Wormbrand. I've read about these guys and I think, oh, that's what it called. Like some, some extreme missionaries over there suffer, but we don't really have to suffer here. Well, think about this. Don't be surprised if in the next year you get pulled in front of a human rights tribunal for quoting scripture online and it's called hate speech. Don't be surprised. That's the way our world's going. Don't be surprised if you receive a ticket for gathering with Jesus, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ. And don't be surprised if the judge rules unjustly and you have to pay the fine. Don't be surprised. That's the way things are going. Don't be surprised if you lose your job over your faith. Don't be surprised. Don't even be surprised if your pastors end up in prison. It's sad. It's not right. We don't welcome it. But don't be surprised by it. Don't be shocked by it. 
Don't be surprised when your kids get excluded from activities or opportunities or universities because they take a biblical stand. Don't be surprised when judges pervert justice. It shouldn't shock us. That's what this passage is saying. It shouldn't shock you that there's a fiery trial for believers. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Look at the followers of Jesus, the first 12 disciples. We have 10 of the 12 disciples, church history records, that they were martyred for their faith. 11 suffered. John suffered for his faith. Apparently he wasn't martyred. Judas abandoned. So we have 10 out of 12. That's 83% of followers of Jesus in the very first 12 died for their faith. That's like so high a percentage. And we think, oh, it shouldn't cost us anything. And look to Jesus, the example, the one we follow, and we look at him and we see that scripture describes him as despised and rejected by men. Jesus never played a wrong card. He never spoke too loud and too harsh at the wrong time, never spoke too soft at the wrong time. He never misstepped. He never swerved in traffic and cut somebody off. He never took somebody else's things. He never erred. And yet he was despised and rejected by men. That just proves you cannot play a perfect hand where there is no suffering in the Christian life. It costs us something and it shouldn't shock us. Sadly, and I say this to my shame, Christianity in the West, in our culture, for the last however many years, has probably never looked in history so comfortable, so lazy, so apathetic, so avoiding of suffering. And so this is just a reminder from scripture. It's not that we go looking for suffering, but we stand for truth. We follow Jesus. We represent him regardless of what the cost is. And perhaps this is a gracious gift from God to wake us up to wake us up and to see the value of something deeper than our comforts, to see the value of the faith that is in us through God's gift. Now this, suffering without rejoicing is wasted suffering. So we're embracing the attitudes. We got the, we expect it, but we're also gonna rejoice in suffering. If you don't rejoice in your suffering, you are wasting it. Look back at verse 13. Paul says this, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you are suffering for Jesus without joy, you're missing it. You're missing what he is offering to you. You're missing the purpose of it. You've got your eyes on the wrong thing. The reality is throughout scripture, we see this, Often with Christians, the more you turn the pressure up, the more joy they have. And it's this weird thing that doesn't make sense on the surface of it. But here's some ways. Here's some reasons. Suffering positions us to rejoice in a way that we otherwise could not. And here's six different ways that it is cause for rejoicing. First, it shows that we are united with Christ. It says it there in verse 13. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. To share in his sufferings doesn't mean that we're somehow now taking on his suffering and we're paying for our sins. And so you feel better that you're like, well, at least I contributed a little bit to my salvation. Not that at all. But what it is, is it's a walking in the footsteps of Jesus and thus assured we're on the right path. Jesus suffered for this. I suffered for this. Ah, probably on the right path. Peter 2 verses 21 tells us that when we suffer for doing good, we are doing the thing to which we have been called because, this is the quote, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Sharing in the suffering of Christ is part of being united with him. It's part of being one with Christ. Not just one with Christ in his life and resurrection, but in his death and his suffering. We identify with him. We have a special fellowship with Christ in suffering. And Romans 6, you can read, elaborates more on that. Suffering for Christ does this. Second, it will be rewarded when Christ returns and his glory is fully revealed. So not all of the benefits of suffering for Christ are recognized right now. We get that. <laughs> we get that in a big way. Sometimes there's a very, very high cost. But at the end of the day, 
when Christ's glory is revealed, it's going to be awesome. You will never say the words, ah, that wasn't worth it. Never will you say that. Suffering for Christ will be rewarded when Christ return, guaranteed. Number three, it enables us to experience his presence in a heightened way. So verse 14, it gives a specific way that listeners might be suffering, suffering for the name of Christ and that they're blessed. And why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. There's a sense in which the spirit of God, God's presence manifests itself in a heightened way when you suffer. It strengthens you and gives you the joy and ability to respond in radical ways. You need to look no further than Acts chapter seven and the, the stoning of the disciple Stephen and the way he responds. And you're like, who among us would respond the way he did when people are throwing stones at him, literally throwing stones at him and killing him? And he responds similar to how Jesus responds, forgive them. And he commits his spirit to the Lord. It's amazing. I will not have in myself that ability. No way. But when you suffer for the name of Jesus, you'll receive something that you don't receive before you get it there. You receive it when you suffer for him. A a heightened manifest presence of God. Verse four, or the fourth thing, we can rejoice in sharing the suffering of Christ because it's a high calling. Rather than thinking of it as something to be avoided, something to be to be that we don't want, it's actually a badge of honor to suffer for the name of Jesus. That's the way that the early disciples saw it. In Acts chapter five, verse 41, the disciples were persecuted. And in verse 41, it says this, when they left the presence of the council, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Counted worthy. They're like, whoa, we just suffered for Jesus. That's special. We were worthy. Praise God that he considered us worthy to suffer for him. What a different mindset. That brings joy. It brings joy to our suffering when we realize that God's glory is being revealed through our genuine faith. 1 Peter 1 verses 6 to 7 says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So think of it this way. Just like fire on gold purifies all the impurities and reveals the gold that is there, so the fire of suffering in our lives burns away all the extra It makes all the extra disappear, our reliance on stuff, our reliance on relationships, our reliance on all those things. And it reveals, if you think of it like maybe, I was thinking of like a candle and like the wick, just imagine it's like a steel cable. And as you burn away the wick, the uh, the wax, it reveals the strength of the steel cable. That's like in our lives, the fiery trials reveal the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And it shows it to be genuine. It shows that you're not just coming to church because it's a great social activity. You're not just standing up for Jesus because everybody's behind you and you're benefiting financially and it makes your family happy. It shows that you truly believe in something you cannot see. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Now here's the cool part. That faith that is revealed through suffering isn't your credit in the end. It actually is God's glory that is revealed because God in 1 Peter, it it reveals God actually guards your salvation through faith, which I believe God gives to you. God gives you the strength and the faith. Then he uses trials and suffering to pull everything else away to show that at the end of the day, that's what saves you. That's what's holding you. And God gets glory through that. So when you have that mindset, you're like, man, okay, so everything that's coming at me is now being used to show God is awesome. The only reason I'm hanging on is because of him. And that brings glory to him. And that helps us to see in our suffering a purpose. God is being glorified when he shows that the only thing holding you is faith in him. Your faith is genuine. Praise God for that. Six, suffering shows us 
shows, sorry, suffering for Christ shows that we're done with sin. It's just like, nope, I'm done with it. Verse, 1 Peter 4, 1 to 2 says this, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So, hey, adjust your thinking. Christ suffered in the flesh. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So if we do good and suffer and continue to do good anyways, we're showing sin has no hold on us. It's gone. It's not a problem anymore. So suffering can reveal victory over sin. And that's awesome. Suffering can also reveal where you don't have victory over sin. And then you realize, okay, Lord, continue to strengthen me, continue to show me. Suffering does tend to make people bitter. It, it often does in our society, makes people bitter. Nobody likes to lose things. Nobody likes to experience discomfort, but it only truly makes you bitter when what is lost was what you valued most. So if you lose your life for the name of Jesus Christ and, or lose your freedom or lose your family or lose your job and you are bitter, that is because you valued that more than the glory of Jesus Christ, more than bringing honor to him, more than seeing the tested genuineness of your faith. Again, it's not, hey, I'm excited to suffer. Yay, bring it on. But it is a joy knowing what the purpose of the suffering is. If you are a Christian, you are going to suffer. You will. Don't waste it by first of all, being surprised and running away from it. Don't waste it by being bitter in it, but rejoice in it and embrace the right attitude. Rejoicing and suffering though, and this is where the passage goes, doesn't mean that we go looking for it. We're not, hey, okay, suffering's good for me because it reveals my faith. So bring on suffering. How do I suffer? I got lots of ideas for you. And the passage says, suffering is wasted when we receive it for the wrong reasons. Look at this but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. You can suffer today by doing any one of these things. You want suffering? Go for it. But that kind of suffering doesn't bring glory to God. That kind of suffering doesn't reveal the tested genuineness of your faith. That kind of suffering dishonors the name of God and is a waste. There's good reasons to be in prison and there's bad reasons to be in prison. A good reason is for the name of Jesus. A bad reason is for murdering someone. Now, initially, this might sound a little bit of a, out of place. Like, what in the world? Why is he bringing up murdering people, being a thief? Like, he's talking to Christian people. But think back to what the people are experiencing. So they're experiencing unjust treatment. They are over and over again having things like their property being taken away from them, being falsely accused, being divided from their family, etc. And most people, myself included, have a certain threshold for what we can take. It's like, you can poke me for a while and I'm okay with it. But once you poke long enough, snap. And that's what he's getting at. Don't, don't let this suffering get under your skin to the point where you become a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a meddler. First Peter 3 verse 9 says how we should respond to this. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. When you're poked, don't poke back. That's really hard. It's really hard when you're just being poked. It's really, really hard when it's like you're being unjustly treated. Don't unjustly treat back. They're murdering your family. What are you doing back? The specific evils that are listed here are fascinating. Murder, that's probably not on the top of our list of actions that we're going to retaliate with. But what about hatred? Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount compares murder to hatred. Do we hate in return? Because that is not of Christ. What about meddling? He goes from like worst to like, oh shoot, we're all guilty of this. Sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong. That's going to get you suffering. And it's not for Jesus. It's because you were an idiot and got involved in something that wasn't your business. It's not trying to be a peacemaker. It's like, I was just being, I just wanted to get in there. I wanted to have my word. 
I wanted to have my say in there. And I feel like I was thinking this this week, that's like a good verse for my social media header. It's like, just stay out of it, right? Don't meddle in somebody else's affairs. How about theft, right? Now, you probably won't believe this, but I actually was guilty of theft this week. I didn't fully know it, but I actually was guilty. I was working on a website for the last few months for an organization called Liberty Coalition. And I, as part of the website, I set up this page where we were pulling news articles from other sites and linking to them. And when it links over, it included a little thumbnail image of the image on the news article. Well, this week we got an email that apparently that's like a copyright infringement, which I totally didn't know. And then we actually had to pay a fine because of this. I'm like, come on. <laughs> it's like linked to your site and whatever else. But hey, it's theft and we had to pay a penalty. That is not suffering. That's just me being clueless about copyright laws. And so now there's no images and it's kind of less interesting. That's theft. We don't want to be guilty for that stuff. And you know, if you actively do that kind of stuff, if you actively are stealing, you should be totally ashamed of that. That is not behavior that's fitting for a believer in Jesus Christ. But there is behavior that you don't have to be ashamed for. And that's what he, he's going to go on to in verse 16 and say. So 1 Peter 4 verse 16, he says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. You don't have to feel an ounce of shame for standing for the things of Jesus. Don't let people say things like, well, you shouldn't have said it then, or you should have said it there. Don't worry about that. If you spoke truth, if you represented Jesus truthfully, no shame. No shame whatsoever. Satan wants you to feel ashamed because he wants you to back down. Stop. Don't feel ashamed at all. Interesting, that name Christian is a title that was given to Christians by unbelievers. Christians didn't think, oh, I'll call myself a Christian first. The, the unbelievers in Antioch called the believers there Christian. Perhaps it's like almost a derogatory term. Ah, there's Christians. But then they kind of like embraced it. And now we use that title all the time. I'm a Christian and I stand unashamed as a Christian. Now think who's actually writing this letter to the believers. It's Peter. Can you think of any specific time in Peter's life when he might have felt ashamed? Yeah. He was asked three times whether he identified, whether he was with Jesus, and he said three times no. Three times he was ashamed of the name of Jesus and backed away because of the cost. And we know God restored him. So one note, there's people around us that may have been ashamed and may have denied Christ, and we're praying for the restoration. We may have done that though. But if you haven't denied Christ, no need to feel ashamed. If you have stood up for him, don't feel ashamed. This is amazing that Peter is saying this. And especially when you know how his life ends, he was one of the ones that was martyred. Don't feel ashamed for bearing the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 17 continues, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? He's reminding them of the ultimate end of the ungodly and the sinner. In this calling for believers not to suffer for doing wrong, Peter reminds them of the outcome of those who don't obey. They will not only suffer now, but also in the future. This isn't meant to somehow say, hey, by your righteous deeds, you're like scarcely saved, like you partially are saved. It's actually like a Jewish argument style where they use this one thing. Really the focus is on how awful the punishment will be for those who don't obey. How awful and catastrophically awful it will be for those who are not in Christ, where we would have been if he hadn't saved us. So don't ever forget, God holds the scales of justice in the end and will pay everyone according to their works. This allows us to endure suffering in a new way where we realize not everything's gonna balance out. The scales aren't gonna balance here. There is gonna be injustice, sometimes for centuries, but at the end, 100% there will be justice. And we can praise God that in Christ, we aren't receiving what we should have. Christ paid that on the cross. And I think about that often. Think about the worst thing somebody has ever done for you. Now imagine that person turns to Christ 
at the end of the age, that person is not going to pay for that sin. Christ is going to pay for that sin. Christ is going to pay for the worst sin that was done against you if that person comes to faith and asks for forgiveness. Now you think, oh, that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, he bore the worst things I have done, but also the worst things of other believers. But those who do not come to Christ will pay for it themselves, 100%. Don't ever forget God holds the scales of justice. And that leads us into our last sentence of our passage. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Our suffering glorifies God and isn't wasted when we keep our focus. Keep your focus. You want to waste your suffering? Lose focus. Get bitter, get miserable. Let the tears fill your eyes and blur out any vision of what you're supposed to be looking at. Get your eyes off of Jesus. Lose trust in him. Stop doing anything good. Just wallow in your misery. There's two words we want to look at in this passage, this last verse and make note of. The word entrust and the word doing. The final reminder to those who are suffering, and we got to realize it says according to God's will, that means it's part of God's will that we would suffer. Not that God's super excited about allowing things like that into our lives, but because it's part of his greater plan for us, which is also comforting because we know he's in control. But he says entrust. Entrust the very most important thing, your soul, to the very most capable person, the faithful creator. So how's your soul today? It's not like a question we probably ask in the hallway. Hey, how's your soul today? But just think for a second, how is, how is my soul today? Is my soul distraught at everything going on? Is it riding the waves of the news cycle from good news, bad news, good news, bad news? Is my soul cast down and anxious about everything going on? Or is your soul entrusted securely, firm in the hope that we have in Christ Jesus? Where's your soul at? We'll take a moment, we'll talk in a moment rather about what we are called to do. But first, remember what you're not called to do. In your suffering, in your hardship, in the trials that come your way, there are some things you're not called to do. And one of them is to play God. It's not your responsibility to be God. You're not called to be sovereign. We're not called to know the future perfectly. Try as we might to figure out all the details. We're not called to save our own soul or even to bring ultimate justice. We do want to maintain justice. We want to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. But at the end of the day, the ultimate scales of justice are in God's hands. And this word entrusting shows up not just in our passage here, but also earlier in 1 Peter. This is interesting. 1 Peter 2.23, talking about Jesus, it says this, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Whoa. Jesus being reviled, is entrusting himself to the father who judges justly? If he can do that, well, we can do that. We haven't experienced anything like what Jesus experienced and suffer and have not suffered like him. And trust though to the one who judges justly. But as you suffer, then don't just sit on your hands. And this is where we leave it. Do something good. Do the right thing. Do what's in front of you that God has given you to do good. Paul or Peter rather here is saying, do good, not evil. If you read the whole letter, he says it over and over and over again. Do good, not evil. Do good, not evil. And you can look and see through Peter, all these examples, but here's some four reasons why he presents this. First, God is a righteous judge. We just entrusted our soul to the one who judges justly. You do wrong, the just judge is going to see it. Live in light of that. Do the right thing. God's going to see it. Second, God ransomed us from our evil ways with the precious blood of Christ. We sing this in songs. I don't know that we actually think about it in our day-to-day examples as much, but it's certainly a helpful reminder. So when you are tempted by sin, do you really want to engage in the very thing that put Jesus on the cross? 
And if you keep the cross in your mind when you're thinking about sin or being tempted by sin, and just think, if, if I was standing in front of you and every time you sinned, a nail got put through my hand, another hammer blow got put the nail through my hand, would you really do it? Every time you sin, another lash on the back of someone, if you actually experience that up close and personal, you would never want to sin. And so Jesus, Paul reminds us, Jesus paid for your salvation with his blood, not with imperishable things, not with a bunch of silver and gold, who cares, with his blood. So do good. Third, you're going to get falsely accused of evil. And one day when the score is finally settled, even the unbelievers will have to admit you did the right thing in those good actions you did. And that's going to bring glory to God. So they might not understand it right now. They might not understand when you're standing and praying to end abortion, that that's a good thing. But in the end, they will. And that will bring glory to God. Fourth, generally speaking, doing good will earn you favor and will minimize unnecessary suffering here and now, which is always a good thing. We're not looking for it. We're not going out of our way to, to poke the bee's nest and to make trouble for ourselves. And it will put to shame anyone who slanders you. Like there's a little bit of us probably that feels really good when somebody gets it wrong and they say something evil about you. And then you're like, and then the truth comes out, you're vindicated and they're like ashamed that they said something stupid. That's the kind of feeling where it's like, oh, so do good. Don't, you don't have to publicize it everywhere, but do good. And then when people actually figure out, they're going to be like, oh, shoot, I can't believe I said that. Honestly, the world doesn't get it. When we return good for evil, they just don't get it. They understand the idea of doing good in order to get a kickback, doing good to people that are close to you. They don't understand the idea of doing good to your enemy, doing good to those who do wicked to you. So these are some things that we can think about as we talk, how do we do good? And so real quick, you're looking, how do I do good this week? You don't have to add 10 things to your list. You don't have to add a whole laundry list of items and be overwhelmed like, I can't do it all. Sometimes it actually just includes taking things away. This past week, my wife and I were like, okay, we're going to take a break from, from Facebook and social media. That was probably actually a good thing for us this week to do good. And we actually were able to focus on some other things. That might be a good thing. Maybe suffering has caused you to turn back to some old habits that need to die. And the good thing is to kill off those habits. Say, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to engage in that anymore. Perhaps your Bible's sitting unread or your house hasn't been open to strangers or you've withdrawn and stopped thinking about serving others. Perhaps a family member or a former friend who has lashed out at you in the last 18 months Maybe it's time to give them a, a, an actual phone call or to pray for them and to actually see if there's a way to restore things. See if maybe they're feeling a little bit regretful of things they've said. Maybe you got stingy thinking the economy was going to go crazy. You're going to lose it all. And you've forgotten that there's actually people in much greater need than you are. These are all ways to do good. And maybe after all we've been through this last year, you're still thinking, hey, this isn't all a big deal for me. This doesn't really affect my life. Our world's kind of going to pot, but who cares? It doesn't affect me. Well, maybe it's time for the good for you to do is to actually put some skin in the game and say, I'm going to start making some phone calls, writing some letters, advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves. Maybe others are suffering around you. And it's time to step in and encourage them. Whatever it is, don't wallow in the self-pity of your own suffering. You've been chosen by the God of the entire universe as a believer in Christ to suffer for his name's sake. And we want to suffer well. We want to arm ourselves with the right attitude. Expect it. It's going to come. We're going to rejoice when it comes, not because we enjoy the actual thing, but we enjoy what God is doing through it, bringing glory to himself. We're going to not... Look for ways to suffer foolishly. We're going to keep our focus on Christ and entrust everything to him. Confident that he's going to take care of his role and then we'll do ours. We'll do good for his glory. 